Uh, good evening. How good it is to be back in the chapel. What a lovely time we had this morning with young James, uh, coming quite a long way to share God's word uh, with us. And I see that our friend Rob put up a couple of items on Facebook about that message. So uh, although it wasn't videoed, at least some of the good things in it uh, will be shared in a wider way. Now I have to give just a few announcements. Uh, <clears throat> we welcome you all and we welcome those who will be able to watch this later on YouTube. At the moment we've had a, a delay uh, with getting the broadband installed but we hope soon that we will be able to put these out live and that's something uh, to pray about. This evening we shall be looking into the last part of Acts chapter 12 and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper will be observed at this service. On Tuesday it is a missionary prayer meeting uh, with a short word from the scriptures at 7.45 p.m. and that's by Zoom. If you haven't got the details then please ask us. Uh, Thursday 10 a.m the usual home prayer group uh, by Zoom. This week, uh, Chris Gad will be leafletting in the area because we're tier three, we're not able to go and knock doors at the moment. Uh, so please pray for that outreach. Special announcements. Please observe the social distancing rules and use the hand gel. Please leave your name and contact number in case contact tracing is needed. Uh, we have masks. I see that you're all well equipped, uh, but uh, if you're not exempt, these are now mandatory and uh, we can always supply some if you forget any time. Now an additional notice, and we have put this in the risk assessment, which can be seen on the website. Please note that as we are now in Tier 3, we should not mingle with anyone outside our household or support bubble. This will limit our interaction, but there are exceptions for those with care needs or work-related matters. Uh, this morning we had the uh, joy of welcoming Rob as a new deacon and uh, he can't be here tonight as a new deacon and as our secretary and we're very pleased to have him we weren't able to lay hands on him physically but we did so as it were spiritually and please remember to pray for him as he uh, gets his teeth into the work and we do express thanks of course as we did in our church meeting to uh, Christine who has done this job for 18 years. And we appreciate all those behind the scenes things so that you can come here and the lights are on and the heating's on and uh, things have been arranged. Now next Lord's Day is the 13th of December and for morning and evening worship 11 and 6.30, I shall be responsible. We're giving a little break from Acts at a convenient point after tonight until the new year. Thank you for your attention to those notices. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you now that we are able to meet together. And although the circumstances are unusual, we praise you, particularly after this last month, in which we have so missed the fellowship together. And we pray for those who still can't be here and uh, will have to see this on, on the video. Lord, we pray that even they may have a blessing uh, through your word. We thank you for your goodness to us this morning. We thank you for the scriptures that were opened and read. And we thank you for the example of Timothy, who cared genuinely, sincerely for the people of God and wanted the best for them. 
And we thank you that he indeed is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for how the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world because he cared for our state. Because he, our Father, came in the knowledge that we needed salvation. He came, our Father, to bring that peace that the gospel alone can bring. To bring that knowledge of yourself, Lord, and to be the way, the truth, and the life. And so we come with thankful hearts tonight and we pray that as we worship together the Lord Jesus may have the glory and we pray Lord that our, our ears may be open to that which you have, have to say to us and our hearts may be open to receive your truth and to walk in the light of it. And Father we do thank you for those who are sharing the gospel tonight sometimes on the internet, sometimes more personally, and sometimes as we think of our, our brother Chris from door to door. Uh, Father, we thank you that you are able to glorify the name of Christ and you are able to save precious souls so that there may be rejoicing in heaven. And our Father, we give you thanks for your goodness to us. And we pray, Lord, that this church may be built up. We thank you for the prospect of this vaccine. We pray that it may indeed be effective and that it may be safe. We pray for wisdom for all who are involved in the distribution of it. And we pray, our Father, that the day might not be too long when once more the fear of it might recede. And uh, Lord, if we haven't already done so, we will begin to find it more important to listen to your voice, to know your peace in our hearts, so that our Father, uh, we will not be, as it were, hanging on the latest news broadcast, but Father, we will be listening for your voice, and therefore, our God, we, we will recognise that we, your people, have prayed for wisdom, for the leaders. We have prayed, Lord, for a solution for this. And Father, you answer in different ways and sometimes you use miraculous means and sometimes you use, as it were, the, the efforts of scientists and doctors and so on. But Father, whatever comes to us, we accept it from your hand. And we pray therefore that we might be content to rest in you and that we might have that peace that passes all understanding as we make our request known to you. So Lord, bring us your blessing tonight, Father. Help us to, to concentrate. Help us to hear what you have to say to us. And Lord, not only to hear it, but to go out and put it into practice. And our Father, we pray too that the Lord Jesus may be glorified as we remember him in the Lord's Supper. Amen. Amen. Let's read from the scriptures a short passage. Uh, it's the end of Acts chapter 12. And we're going to we'll try and link it back to uh, what we did uh, uh, last time, which uh, actually was, of course, on um, uh, on the internet while the church was closed. Verse 20 of Acts chapter 12. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord. And having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. 
And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word. And we're going to look at that a little later on. But Jean, have you got a hymn or hymns for us? Thank uh, you. Yes, I have actually. Uh, thank you. Um, and it's, if we can look at uh, uh, hymn number 403, the mission phrase, 403. But before we sing, I'd like to just uh, quote one verse um, from the same passage that George has just read. Because I've got the message um, uh, translation here. And uh, verse 24 it says, Meanwhile, the ministry of God's word grew by leaps and bounds. Mm. And so let all the earth hear his voice. Let the people rejoice at the sound of his name. Let all the valleys and hills burst with joy, and the trees of the fields clap their hands. Justice and love will he bring to the world. His kingdom will never fail. And we write a two-edged sword in our hand. His word and truth shall prevail. Some more for later on, have you, Jean? Yeah, thank you. So we come back to exciting acts, or as someone has called them, amazing acts. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when we were doing this uh, online, of course, uh, uh, from from my study, actually. 
we looked into the first and larger part of Acts chapter 12 and we uh, reflected on the phrase from Wesley's great hymn, My Chains Fell Off. And Peter's chains fell off literally at the beginning of this chapter, much for the to the disappointment and anger of Herod. Now, you appreciate that Herod is, is more of a title than a name, and uh, there, there are, it's not the same Herod as was around at the time of the crucifixion and resurrection, and in chapter 4, we've moved on a little bit from there. But our title for tonight is Give God the Glory, because we're told uh, that Herod uh, was judged in verse 23 because he did not give glory to God. Now, some of you will have seen the advertisement that is going round for a certain supermarket which uh, says that there is no naughty list this year. And they're presumably referring to a gentleman in a red outfit who is alleged uh, to uh, keep a list of those who have been naughty so that they don't get the present that they want. And a bit of a good market employee may be by that particular supermarket. But of course you see, today the word naughty is regarded as not a very serious thing. But if you were to go back three or four hundred years ago, and indeed if you were to read our good authorised version, you would read a, a very intriguing phrase there, superfluities of naughtiness. And you'd say, what on earth does that mean? What it meant, of course, then, it was intended, as translated then, it was intended to indicate something really bad. And to be naughty wasn't something that wasn't very serious or something you could joke about. It was to be exceedingly sinful. So what we actually find here is that Herod was in God's bad books, as it were. If you like it, he was on the naughty list. And what we're going to look at and see is why? Why? Now, who was this Herod? Because we didn't go into detail with that when we looked at the larger part of the chapter. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I brought along with me, not to boast about the books I've got, but you've heard me mention Professor Bruce and his excellent commentary, and he tells us something about who this man was. And he was Herod Agrippa the first. Not the same Herod who is mentioned earlier on, who was Herod Antipas. But we can see that he was a pretty unsavoury character and quite a hypocrite. We're told that he was born in 11 BC. And his title as a Roman citizen was M. Julius Agrippa, no doubt because of his father's friendship with a Roman statesman of that name. After his father's execution in 7 BC, he was sent with his mother Berenice to Rome, where he grew up on terms of intimacy with the imperial family. He became so heavily involved in debt that in AD 23, he had to retire to Idumea. Through the influence of his sister Herodias, if you remember the Gospels, you'll know about Herodias and you'll know about what happened to John the Baptist. He received an asylum and pension at Tiberias from his uncle Antipas. And that, of course, is the Herod at the time of the crucifixion and the Herod uh, as far as Acts chapter 4 at least that we read about before. But he eventually quarrelled with his uncle. In 36, 
he returned, AD 36, he returned to Rome but offended Tiberius and was in prison. He was released the following year by Gaius, the successor of Tiberius, received from him the title of king, the tetrarchies of Philip and Lysanias, and a gold chain equal in weight to the iron one which he had worn in prison. So he's on the up now. When Antipas was banished in 39, Agrippa received his tetrarchy as well. He was able in AD 40 to dissuade Gaius from his intention to have his statue set up in the temple of Jerusalem. He continued to enjoy the imperial favour under Claudius, who added Judea and Samaria to his territory, so that his kingdom, 41 to 44, was comparable to his grandfather's. In Palestine, he sedulously cultivated the goodwill of the Jews, observing their customs and preferring their company so that even the Pharisees thought well of him. On one occasion at the Feast of Tabernacles, he is said to have wept as he read Deuteronomy 17.15, remembering his Edomite ancestry, whereupon the people called out repeatedly, you are our brother. So you'll see from that that he was someone who knew how to ingratiate himself. And the point of reading that background is to see basically what sort of man he was, how he was a social climber, and how, of course, he rather enjoyed being well thought of. And... Uh, would even shed a few tears if necessary to try to convince people of his uh, credibility. There are some intriguing things in these few verses. Herod's power went to his head and he meets his end. But not for the reason you might have expected. Because when you go back to the beginning of the chapter, you find him getting James killed with the sword. You uh, find him uh, attacking various members of the early church. And you might already have thought, there we are, this man has done things wrong, and it's not surprising that God judges him. But the key verse of the passage that we have read is actually verse 23. We're told why he was struck by an angel of the Lord and died in a particularly awful way. We're told it was because he did not give glory to God. Now I would reckon that most people's idea about doing wrong and about sin is it's all to do with something that you have done. In other words, you have committed a sin. But he is a man who sinned and the judgment of God came upon him, not because of something he had done, but because of something he hadn't done. He didn't give glory to God. And it's that thought I want us to keep in mind. But what sort of things had he actually done? Well, he'd attacked God's people, first of all. We saw that at the beginning of the chapter. And way back in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8, and you might be familiar with this, God said that his earthly people, Israel, were the apple of his eye. Now, the apple of his eye is what we call the pupil. And you can't imagine anything more precious to you, anything you would want to guard more than the pupil of your eye. And those, of course, who have a severe eye problems will appreciate that more than even I can. It is the most precious thing to us, isn't it? The pupil of the eye. I don't know what I would do if my sight was damaged. And so the purpose of that verse in Zechariah 2.8 
is to show how important, how valued, how precious are the people of God to him. Now that you're going to say, well yes, but that was talking about Israel. But I'm quite sure that that applies to the church too. If you cast your mind back to the verses we read in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, you've got Saul of Tarsus, as he was then, unconverted, on his way to Damascus, and what is he about to do? He wants to put an end to those who are followers of the way, who were later called Christians, Acts chapter 11, and he's on his way to Damascus, He's going to get them put in prison. Saul of Tarsus was quite uh, happy uh, and content to be involved at the martyrdom, the death of Stephen there in Acts uh, chapter 7. And so there is Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus to pursue his campaign against God's heavenly people the church now and what does the lord jesus say to him saul saul why are you persecuting me because as far as the lord was concerned to attack his people just as in zechariah so it was still true to attack his people was to attack him they were precious to him and Herod was guilty of this, wasn't he? Because that's exactly what he does at the beginning of the chapter. Chapter 12 and verse 1. And you might have said, well look, he's had James killed with the sword. He's been frustrated, but his intention was to get Peter killed as well. Surely God will act against this man. And sometimes when we see people do the most evil, and we have seen it in our lifetime. And those a little before us saw it, of course, in the days of Adolf Hitler. And we think of all those awful, awful people and what they have done. Pol Pot, Joseph Stalin, people like that. And those who have uh, uh, committed the most awful mass murders and so on. And we say, well, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God act now? And if you'd been in that early church, you would have been probably saying, well, look, he's just had, he's just had James killed now. And he's attacking others. It's clear from Acts chapter 12, verse 1, as I said a couple of weeks ago, that there were others who were targets of his. And of course, most of the chapter tells us how the angel brought Peter out. But against this background of persecution from this puppet king, this puppet ruler, this political persecution, as we said last time, rather than the religious persecution which they had endured from Saul and from the Sadducees particularly and even some of the Pharisees. Surely, surely those early Christians must have said, Lord, why don't you do something? Why don't you strike this man and stop him? He attacked God's people. But it was not for that. But he was finally judged. Secondly, he had left God out of his reckoning. We finished off at verse 19 last time. And we found that he examined the guards. He wasn't uh, content with the answer they gave. With the protestations that no, they hadn't fallen asleep. And they had no idea whatsoever how Peter had escaped, and faced with the fact, knowing of course, having been alive at the time of the crucifixion of the Lord, and knowing the, um, knowing the resurrection and the fact of the resurrection, and it was a bit like that for Peter, wasn't it? Because the angel getting Peter out of jail from what seemed like certain death, was as it were, and I think I mentioned this last time, it almost threw us back to that, to think about the resurrection and the Lord Jesus rising from the dead. It was a divine action. But this man has left God out of his reckoning. So to him, somebody has to be to blame, and it was most likely the guards, and he commanded that they should be put to death, 
and he goes off in a huff and goes off for a seaside holiday. And then we come to the next event in verse 20. He had left God out of his reckoning. He had failed to recognise that a divine hand was responsible for Peter's rescue. Just as his uncle before him, and just as all those people there after the resurrection had failed to recognise that this was not some plot by which the gods had been bribed or fallen asleep and the disciples had stolen the body. But they failed to recognise the truth was that it was God and God had intervened and Jesus was alive again and it was true because nothing, nothing is beyond the power of God. And can I stress that to you tonight, dear brother or sister, if you are struggling at the moment, if there is something in your life which is getting you down and you've come in here tonight and you say, well, I didn't want to hear all that history about this fellow from all those years ago, what good is that to me? If you're saying in your heart tonight, I need some comfort, I need something from the Lord. Well, the greatest comfort I can offer you is to know that God is the God of the miraculous. But God is the God of absolute power. And the God who can raise Jesus from the dead, it was a small matter to him to send an angel to get Peter out of jail. And it's a small matter for that God to deal with the most pressing, with the most serious difficulties you might have in your life right now. If you're being swallowed up by loneliness or pressure or pain, there is a God in heaven, I say today. There is a God in heaven. And this is the second thing we see about Herod. He had left God out of the reckoning. No effort is spared by the God who delivers. The God who brought Daniel out of a den of lions. The God who brought his three friends out of the fiery furnace. The God who brought Jesus again from the dead. The God who brought Peter out of prison is the God who can do all things. And Herod has left God out of his reckoning. And all around us there are men and women who are leaving God out of their reckoning. That's why they're not in this chapel, probably wouldn't be full. Because God has been left out of their reckoning. There was a time when I left God out of my reckoning. But he was working in my life, nonetheless. And even as Christians so often, we say, oh, woe is me. How am I going to cope with this? And we forget those words, but God, but God. So Herod, should he not have been judged? Should not God have moved against him? Because he had left God out of his right. Apparently not. But then we read that he was full of pride. Just see him now. Just see him. The people of Tyre and Sidon want to get his favour. They need the trade. It's a bit like uh, the present negotiations, you know. The French need our fish. And uh, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, I'm not going to get political, by you, take sides on this, but I'm not here to do that. I'm here to preach the gospel and talk about Jesus. But let's get this plain. For some reason, we seem to think that we need to get things and get them a bit cheaper from them. So there are motivations going on. And here are these people and they've managed to get Blastus, the king's personal aid, it says here. Some translations say Chamberlain. This man uh, was uh, like a personal manservant, it would appear. The name Blastus is very common so we won't necessarily know which one it was. Josephus, the Jewish historian, he's quite useful, but he's not always very accurate. Luke is a much more accurate historian uh, than Josephus, by the way. You might find it useful to read his stuff, but bear in mind that this is the word of God. This is the inspired word of God. 
And even those who are not Christians, I've told you before, they respect and admire Luke's accuracy. So Luke is much more accurate. Uh, but it's plain that this man was in a position to get the ear of the king. And as a result, Herod says, all right then, we'll make a deal. We'll have a treaty. And on a set day, verse 21, arrayed in royal apparel. You see what Luke's trying to build up this picture here. He sat on his throne and he gave an oration to them. But remember, this is a man who uh, a little bit earlier had, uh, had uh, wept when it suited him. He knew how to handle a crowd, you see. And of course they want to be in his good books. He's in God's bad books, but they want to be in his good books. And you can just see it, can't you? Here's this man, and he's puffing himself up. And he sees the crowds, and of course they, they want... They want what they want from him. They want the trade deal and all the rest of it. So important, you know. He was full of pride. This puppet ruler fancied himself. Arrayed in fine clothes. Josephus tells us that it was clothes with silver threads in it and so on. Whether that's so or not, I don't know. But he's on a throne. And he's surveying with great delight this servile crowd before him. You say, what's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with it. If you turn back to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6 and verse 17, you'll read that God hates pride. These six things does the Lord hate. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And what's the first one? It's pride. The proud look. The proud look. If anybody ought to be humble, it's you and me as Christian people, if you're a believer tonight. And if you're not yet a believer, you're a churchgoer, but you're not yet a believer, oh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We humble ourselves because we know we didn't deserve the salvation that Jesus has given us. We know that we didn't deserve God's Son to come from heaven to save a wretch like me. And we humble ourselves in the face of God. The Christian never ought to have the proud look. The Christian should always quietly and gratefully acknowledge that everything we have, we owe to God's grace, his undeserved favour. God hates pride. And in Proverbs 16, 18, he vows downfall to the proud You'll be familiar with the phrase, pride goes before a fall. Actually, it's a misquotation. But nonetheless, the thought is there. There is that pride that goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. So God hates it and he vows a downfall to it. History records, as we were saying, that he was into fine speeches. And one can picture him warming to his theme of his greatness and his power. Now listen, you people of Tyre and Sidon. You're here today, and you're here today because I am a wonderful king. And providing you do what I say, everything will be well. And he puts before them this golden future. And he speaks with his great swelling words, and they not only have to put up with it, but they cheer him on. Verse 22. The people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Surely now, surely the anger of God will fall. The anger of God will fall on him. Judgment will come because... He, just the more he sees that they're liking it, the more he continues. Surely, judgment will fall. So is what have I been saying? I've been saying we think of sin as being something you do. In actual fact, the word means to miss the mark. It's not reaching God's standard. And you can't reach God's standard. That's why we needed a saviour. 
who was, as we were told this morning, was our substitute who died in our place. You can never make yourself good enough for God, however many times you might come to chapel, whatever good you might do, however much you might give to charity. But this man, surely, now the anger of God must fall. And yet, and yet the reason for judgment, we come back to our text, verse 23, the reason for judgment is because he did not give glory to God. What should he have done? He should have raised his hand and stopped them. He should say, oh, no, 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 I, I like this, fellas, but let me say, you mustn't say that. You mustn't say that. This man knew what he was allowing them to say. We have a contrast. When we come to Acts 14, we have a contrast. There's Paul and Barnabas. When the people see the power of God, even people, this was, who didn't know anything uh, about Judaism, who didn't know anything about Christianity, but when they saw the power of God, they wanted to treat Paul and Barnabas as gods. And Paul and Barnabas are absolutely distraught. No, no, they leap amongst the people and say, no, you mustn't do that. We are human beings. And we see this again and again through scripture. We see men and angels refusing to accept veneration and worship. The reason for judgment wasn't because he'd attacked God's people. It wasn't because he had left God out of his reckoning. It wasn't even because he was full of pride. But we're told because he did not give glory to God. Something he should have done, which he didn't. Oh dear. Proverbs 29, 1. I'm quoting a bit from Proverbs tonight, but these verses came to me as I was studying. Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without a remedy. You see, Herod could not escape judgment by saying, I didn't tell them to say that. What he should have done was stop them. He does not correct them. The more they fate him, the more his head is swelling. And look at verse 23. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him. Have you noticed? I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, but maybe you didn't all get the chance to see the video then. Have you noticed how often angels keep popping up in the Acts of the Apostles? At the beginning of a chapter, you've got an angel who gets... Peter out of prison. And here we come to nearly the end of a chapter and you've got an angel who executes the judgment of God upon Herod. Not primarily because he'd attacked God's people and had James slain. Not primarily because he left God out of his wreck. Not primarily even because he was full of pride. I wonder if it was the same angel. I was interested to see that Bruce uh, suggest, says that someone else suggests that as well. I wonder if it was the same angel who got Peter out of prison. My. I sometimes think that God has a little sense of humour, you know. That would be good, wouldn't it? Hmm? It doesn't matter. There are thousands of angels. There's a man in the Old Testament and he's terrified and he turns to his master and he says, look at this vast army against us. And the prophet says, open, open the young man's eyes that he might see. And there was this vast crowd of heavenly messengers there to shield them and protect them. There used to be a song years ago, I, I, I spoke... But John, you probably sung it. He could have called 10,000 angels. 
Well, actually, it was something more than that. When the Lord said, I could get 12 legions of angels to come and get me out of going to the cross. When the Lord said that, 12 legions of angels. Well, a legion was probably not entirely an exact number, but roughly around 600. So, so get it, you know, start working in the 6,000, sorry. 6,000, so start working it out. Remember your arithmetic, 12 sixes? 72, yes. 72,000 angels. There'd have been a lot left if the Lord had called them, but he didn't. As the old song says, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And so this angel comes. Now, angels aren't into democracy. I would reckon that this angel, maybe there on the edge of the crowd, was getting pretty frustrated with this fellow Herod by this time. But angels aren't into democracy. It's a, I think it's a lie of him, isn't it? They fly at his command. And so the angel doesn't strike the blow until the word comes from the throne. Maybe he looked up to the throne. I can see this angel now and he's looking up to the throne and he says, Lord, you can't let that pass. I know you haven't judged him till now, but Lord, you can't let that pass. I don't know. I don't know whether the angel protested and looked at the throne, but whatever, the word was given and the angel delivered the blow, and it sounds like a pretty awful death too. He was eaten by worms and died. Apparently, from how that phrase is used in other places in, uh, in Greek literature, it indicates a pretty horrible, horrible and repulsive death. He was eaten by worms and died. Now please see this. Usually we think sin is something we do. But Herod perishes in verse 23 because of something he didn't do. Now let me ask you something. As I asked myself, when I sat in my study and bowed my head, could it ever be true of me that I fail to give God the glory? Could it ever be true of you that we fail to give God the glory? Even as Christians, we can do that. And some people, you know, they don't get it. They don't get it why myself and other people who preach are reluctant to accept praise. It's not that we don't appreciate. If you've been blessed by the word of God, then give the glory to God. But of course we appreciate your encouragement and we appreciate and need your prayers. But why is it we sometimes seem to be a bit reluctant to accept praise? Because we want to give God the glory. We want to give God the glory. And this man failed. To give God the glory. Any skill you have. Any ability that you have. Anything that you have managed to achieve. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. And give God the glory when you witness to your neighbour or your colleague or your friend or your family member. Give God the glory. And when they say that you've done well, say in the words of one of the modern songs, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Give God the glory. Are you giving God the glory? Now the chapter ends with a beautiful contrast in verse 24. Herod's demise is just a footnote. The gospel marches on. And, and Jean giving us the alternative translation there emphasised it, didn't we? But the word of God grew and multiplied. I can't remember the exact words you had there 
Jean, that you, you read to us uh, along with the song. The word of God, by leaps and bounds, I think it was, wasn't it? And you see, it's going on, and it must go on. The word of God is growing. As Herod is being eaten up and shrinking into death, the word of God is growing. You see, Luke's the master of making the point. And here is the but on those beautiful words of scripture. Against the sadness of the death of James. Against the drama of the escape of Peter. Quietly, God's work is going on. And God's word is growing. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The Lord Jesus said that in Matthew 16. And our theme verse, you remember, for the book of the Acts is chapter 1 and verse 8. You shall be witnesses unto me in, in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so it, it will go on. Our theme verse must be fulfilled. They would be Jesus' witnesses. And neither the Jewish councils that we read about in the early chapters, nor the puppet rulers like Herod and others that we will read of later, nor yet the might of Rome could stop them. And so after the canon of scripture is closed with the book of Revelation, we read in history of the martyrs of Rome. We read of the Christians being thrown to the lions. We read of those who Herod set alight and used as torches for his garden parties. That's the reality of being a Christian. Those people who say, oh, you, you just want comfort. Uh, you just want friendship. And that's why you're a Christian. <laughs> Would that... Would that take you for persecution like that? Would that take you for what is happening in North Korea, in Nigeria and other parts of this world today where Christians are persecuted? No, of course it wouldn't. But the power of God and the love of Christ through Christ in me would. And nothing would stop them. In verse 25 we might link more with chapter 13, and we'll start there when we come back to this in the new year. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Yes, the John Mark, whose house Peter went to when he was released earlier in this chapter. And here is where it turns. Verse 25 of Acts chapter 12. I told you it was an alternative outline. I told you this in the beginning, an alternative outline to the book of Acts. is chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 24 of chapter 12 as part 1. And then part 2 from verse 25. And so then we go into chapter 13 and we, the... The focus switches from Jerusalem to Antioch. And from there Paul went out on those amazing missionary journeys. And finally he got to Rome. But also they had fulfilled their ministry. What ministry was that? Go back a few chapters in your mind. And this was to take help to the needy Christians during a famine, the Christians in Jerusalem. And so, as well as the gospel going on, the quiet work of providing for the needy was also going on. His saints and his truth are marching on. And you know something, they still are. They still are today. Amen. I'm going to pray and then we will uh, come down uh, to observe the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for opening your truth to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what we've read. Solemn things, sad things that this man did not 
yield to you. And Lord, he had had opportunities and still he did not yield to you. Just like his uncle and our father, so he too would die. And we think of those around and pray there might not be anyone in this room who has never yielded to you and given you the glory. Father, these are solemn things. We praise you that there is a saviour from the darkest, from the worst sins. And Father, we thank you for the man who we remembered this morning in Philippians chapter 2, the Lord Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Lord, help us to humble ourselves and give glory to you. Amen. An amazing word from John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14, has just come to me. As I sat here looking at the bread on the table, remembering that the Lord Jesus said, 
when he instituted that supper, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And of course, he didn't mean that the bread was literally his body. He meant it symbolized it. And in verse 14 of John chapter 1, a well-known verse we read, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. A few Tuesdays ago on our Zoom meeting, our brother here uh, took us uh, to, uh, the, uh, to that uh, thought of the transfiguration. And indeed, it may well be that John uh, was thinking of the transfiguration when he said, we beheld his glory. It may be, of course, he was thinking of the moral glory that he and the other disciples had seen over the course of almost three years. We may not be able to resolve which of those two it is or whether it's more general than that. But the word became flesh. The Lord Jesus came here in a real body. I love those words of Wesley's hymn that we sometimes sing around this time of the year. Our God contracted to a span, incomparably made man. And as we're going to take this bread and this cup and remember the Lord Jesus, let us reflect on the reality of the incarnation the reality of God being here in human form. Let us remember not to linger on duly at the cradle, but to go to the cross. For indeed, he became, Hebrews tells us, a little lower than the angels, or for a little while lower than the angels, with a view to the suffering of death. And the one who lay in his mother's arms would one day be lifted up upon a cross. And it is because of that. It is because he humbled himself that he is now exalted. It is because of that that we have a Lord's Supper. It is because of that there is a gospel, a good news of the love of Christ and salvation. So even if until now we have not given God the glory, there is the opportunity still tonight to do that and to worship at the pierced feet of the precious Lord. Let us just pause for a moment and then we will give thanks for the bread and share it together. Father, we thank you for what this bread symbolizes. We thank you that it reminds us that the Lord Jesus came into this world. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It reminds us, our Father, there were those who saw him, who heard him, and then relayed that message along with others through the book of the Acts and down through the centuries it eventually came to us and so we sit at the table and we break bread and we remember his love. Father, may these things be real to us tonight 
And may we give him the God, the Word, the Logos, who became flesh and dwelt amongst men. May we give him the glory. Amen. Amen. The bread which we break, is it not the fellowship of the body of Christ? A real body has blood. And the Lord Jesus here in a real body shed that blood. And we call it that precious blood, as Peter does. And it is precious to us because we say in the words of the old verse, shed for rebels, shed for sinners, shed for me. As we take the cup and retain it till all have been served so that we might remember him together. May the reality of this truth be before our hearts. And may we worship him as he told us to in John chapter 4 as he said to the woman of Samaria that we should worship in spirit and in truth. May there be that reality as we take this cup as we remember his love for the cup of blessing which we bless. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Is it not the fellowship of the blood of Christ? Amen.
precious, precious blood of Jesus. Father, we remember that before he went to the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, glorify your name. Father, we ask that you will glorify your name in our hearts and lives. But having sat here quietly and remembered the love of Christ, that we might give glory in all things to you. And Father, that you would glorify your name not only in our hearts, but in our families, in our community. Lord, we pray that you would so work in us that as we walk humbly before you, acknowledge that we have nothing that we have because of our efforts, but because of your grace. Lord, we pray that the Lord Jesus may be exalted and his name be glorified. Amen. Amen.